everyone, I am Given Lapid and welcome to our new lesson here in our course, Survey of English and American Literature. For today's video lecture, we will be discussing about the period of revolution and restoration, particularly the story Paradise Lost. To begin our lesson today, let me share with you our objectives for today's lesson. For the first objective, describe the emergence of the story during the period of revolution. For the second objective, analyze key themes in the story. And for the third objective, outline Milton's depiction of Satan in the poem. And now, let us start with our discussion regarding Paradise Lost. Paradise Lost, an epic poem in blank verse, is one of the late works by John Milton, originally issued in 10 books in 1667, and with books 7 and 10, each split into two parts, published in 12 books, in the second edition of 1674. It is considered to be Milton's masterpiece and it helps solidify his reputation as one of the greatest English poets of his time. This poem concerns the biblical story of the fall of man, the temptation of Adam and Eve by the fallen angel Satan and their expulsion from the Garden of Eden. John Milton, the author of Paradise Lost, was an English poet and intellectual who served as a civil servant for the Commonwealth of England under its Council of State and later under Oliver Cromwell. He wrote at a time of religious flux and political upheaval and is best known for his epic poem, Paradise Lost. Before we go deeper in our lesson today, I want you first to watch the video in the next slide for you to have an idea regarding our story today. The introduction of Paradise Lost conforms to epic tradition, with John Milton stating his theme of the fall and invoking a heavenly muse to inspire his effort to justify the ways of God to man. He begins his story in Medius Race. The rising action of the poem begins when God has cast Satan and his rebel army of fallen angels out of heaven, and they are floating on a fiery lake in hell. Led by Satan, these fallen angels form a council to debate how to continue their resistance to God. Through his second-in-command, Satan convinces them that the best target is man, God's newest creation. Satan volunteers to fly to the world full of God's new creatures. His children, sin and death, help him exit through the gates of hell. When Satan promises to return territory usurped by God, chaos and night direct him to the new world. God already knows that Satan will succeed in tempting and corrupting mankind. He announces that man will be punished for his disobedience because he created humans to be strong enough to withstand such temptations. He claims that his new creations will be punished by death unless someone in heaven is willing to die on their behalf. God's only son volunteers. Satan lands in the new world and sneaks into the Garden of Eden disguised as a cherub. Once inside the garden, he watches Adam and Eve and is envious of the beauty and happiness that indicates God's favor. Though he has a moment of doubt, Satan stays resolved to his plan to corrupt them. He overhears Adam and Eve discussing the forbidden fruit of the tree of knowledge and Satan decides to seduce them with this fruit. Uriel, an angel guarding paradise, realizes that the cherub is really Satan in disguise and he sends angels to find the intruder. They find Satan at Eve's ear, whispering into her dreams, and they return Satan to Gabriel. Satan prepares for battle. 
But God then sends a warning, a pair of golden scales in the sky to demonstrate the futility of Satan's resistance. Recognizing that God has the ultimate power and advantage, Satan flees. God decides that although he cannot control their actions, he must warn Adam and Eve about Satan. So he sends his archangel Raphael to Adam to remind him of his free will and to warn him about Satan's plotting. Raphael also tells Adam the story of Satan's rebellion in heaven, the ultimate defeat of his army and his expulsion into hell. After Raphael finishes telling Adam the story, Satan returns to the Garden of Eden, taking on the form of a serpent. In the climax of the poem, Satan finds Eve alone and tempts her with knowledge and status if she eats the fruit of the tree of knowledge. After hesitating, she eats the fruit and then offers it to Adam. Though he realizes that they're doomed, Adam eats the fruit so they will share the same fate. In the falling action, God is angry and sends the son to the Garden of Eden to deliver his judgment. Eve and all women will experience pain in childbirth and they must submit to their husband's will. Adam and all men will labor to grow food from cursed ground. Satan's delighted by his success, and his children, sin and death, build a bridge between hell and earth. Satan returns triumphant to hell, but the sun transforms him and all his followers into serpents, doomed to eternally hunger for fruit that turns to ashes when they bite into it. God next orders angels to change the new world to reflect Adam and Eve's fall, and they alter the weather and create discord between humans and animals. Adam and Eve argue and blame each other for their condition, but ultimately they confess to God, ask pardon and repent. God is merciful, promising to reward their obedience with an afterlife in heaven. God sends the Archangel Michael to show Adam visions of their future. Cain will murder Abel, tyrants will rule, and God's flood will wipe out all but Noah's family and their animals. The vision of Noah's survival offers Adam hope in addition to depicting the suffering that humans will endure. In the resolution, Adam and Eve finally leave paradise, accepting their fate. Begin with, Paradise Lost is about Adam and Eve, how they came to be created, and how they came to lose their place in the Garden of Eden, also called Paradise. It's the same story you find in the Bible, expanded by Milton in a very long, detailed narrative poem. It also includes the story of the origin of Satan. Originally, he was called Lucifer an angel in heaven who led his followers in a war against God and was ultimately sent with them to hell. Many scholars consider Paradise Lost to be one of the greatest poems in the English language. It tells the biblical story of the fall from grace of Adam and Eve and by extension all humanity in language that is a supreme achievement of rhythm and sound. The 12 book structure, the technique of beginning in midges rest or in the middle of the story, in the invocation of the muse, and the use of the epic question are all classically inspired. The subject matter, however, is distinctly Christian. Now, let us move on to the characters of the story. For let us first discuss the major characters in the story. For our first character, we have God the Father. One part of the Christian Trinity, God the Father creates the world by means of God the Son, creating Adam and Eve last. He foresees the fall of mankind through them. He does not prevent their fall in order to preserve their free will, but he does allow his son to atone for their sins. For our next character, we have 
God the Son. Jesus Christ, the second part of the Trinity, he delivers the fatal blow to Satan's forces, sending them down into hell before the creation of earth. When the fall of man is predicted, he offers himself as a sacrifice to pay for the sins of mankind, so that God the Father can be both just and merciful. For our next character, we have Adam. Adam is the first human, the father of our race, and along with his wife Eve, the caretaker of the Garden of Eden. Adam is grateful and obedient to God, but falls from grace when Eve convinces him to join her in the sin of eating from the tree of knowledge. For our next character, we have Eve. The first woman and the mother of mankind, Eve was made from a rib taken from Adam's side. Because she was made from Adam and for Adam, she is subservient to him. She is also weaker than Adam. So Satan focuses his powers of temptation on her. He succeeds in getting her to eat the fruit of the forbidden tree despite God's command. major character, we have Lucifer, head of the rebellious angels who have just fallen from heaven. As the poem's antagonist, Satan is the originator of the sin, the first to be ungrateful for the God the Father's blessings. He embarks on a mission to earth that eventually leads to the fall of Adam and Eve, but also worsens his eternal punishment. His character changes throughout the poem. Satan often appears to speak rationally and persuasively, but later in the poem, we see the inconsistency and irrationality of his thoughts. He can assume any form, adopting both glorious and humble shapes. Let us now move on to the minor characters in the story. first minor character, we have Angel Gabriel, one of the archangels of heaven who acts as a guard at the Garden of Eden. Gabriel confronts Satan after his angels find Satan whispering to Eve in the Garden. For our next character, we have Angel Raphael, one of the archangels in heaven who acts as one of God's messengers. Raphael informs Adam of Satan's plot to seduce them into sin and also narrates the story of the fallen angels as well as the fall of Satan. For our next character, we have Angel Uriel, an angel who guards the planet Earth. Uriel is the angel whom Satan tricks when he is disguised as a cherub. Uriel, as a good angel and guardian, tries to correct his error by making the other angels aware of Satan's presence. For our next character, we have Sin. Satan's daughter, who sprang full formed from Satan's head when he was still in heaven. Sin has the shape of a woman above the waist, that of a serpent below, and her middle is ringed about with the hellhounds who periodically burrow into her womb and gnaw her entrails. She guards the gates of hell. And for our last character, we have Death. Satan's son by his daughter Sin. Death in turn rapes his mother begetting the mass of beasts that torment her lower half. The relations between death, sin, and Satan may make horribly those of the Holy Trinity. And let us now move on to the story analysis, particularly the tone and setting. 
for the setting of the story, the first two episodes are set in hell. As Swan moves away from the first gathering of fallen angels, hell turns into a freezing arctic wilderness. Melton describes the freezing section of hell as so called it's hot. Books 3 and 6 are set in heaven. Milton goes from hell to heaven to underline the contrast. Hell is exceedingly hot and cold, whereas heaven is moderately hot and cool. Hell is also dark, whereas heaven is dazzling. Heaven's nighttime is not actually dark, but simply faint. Heaven, on the other hand, is the most peaceful place on earth. The rest of the poem is set in the Garden of Eden. Paradise is as expected. Animals coexist peacefully, and the weather is always lovely. The moment where Adam and Eve drink from a refreshing brook drives home to the point. Tone of the story, Adam and Eve's fall was one of the greatest human tragedies. According to Milton, Satan's revolt and revenge plans are not amusing. Milton often paints lovely, romantic themes, but he's never amusing. He was a radical Protestant, and the Bible, for him, was just book of the books. He didn't want to joke. Milton's poetry generally has a tragic undertone. The poem was originally intended to be a tragedy a la Shakespeare. Milton realized he wanted to try something different at some point. Milton reconceptualized his poem, although he still approaches it as a tragedy. Even when Milton isn't being overtly melancholy, one can hear it in his voice. It's true that Milton makes their very apparent that such a location no longer exists, and that the only way to access it is through poetry or imagination. Now move on to the plot analysis of the story. Let us start with the introduction of the story. The story begins when Satan and his legions wake up in hell. Satan is introduced in the poem as he has fallen from heaven and awakens on a scorching lake. He knows he's lost everything and is now trapped in an awful situation. He is so enraged with God that he wishes to exact revenge. He's heard reports of a new world filled with strange animals which he swears to seduce or destroy. the rising action, Satan lands in the garden. Satan easily scales the wall and enters the garden. We have no idea what will happen next, but we know he is up to something terrible. This is when his sinister intentions truly begin. Satan has little difficulty infiltrating the garden. He has little opportunity to do anything other than acquire information since God's angels discover him and abduct him. For the climax, Eve eats the fruit and then convinces Adam to as well. This is the point at which Adam and Eve lose their innocence. Immediately following the fruit's consumption, Adam stares at Eve with lascivious eyes, in other words, in a lusty manner rather than a loving manner. They quickly recognized their nakedness, covered themselves with some fig leaves, and were booted out of paradise to eat the forbidden fruit. This is, without a doubt, the poem's most pivotal point. Let us now move on to the following action. Adam and Eve hang out and don't realize they have to leave paradise. 
while we've all heard the narrative of Adam and Eve, we can help but hope that this time, God will be more kind. Adam and Eve are still alive, and we hope that the Bible story does not come true. This is, after all, Milton's work, not the Bible. It's an actual work of art. Perhaps Adam and Eve will not be expelled from Eden this time. And for the Dinoma, Adam and Eve learn they must leave paradise. This is the result of Adam and Eve's sin, as God has indicated throughout. To make matters worse, Michael gives Adam a quick lesson on the consequences of his and his wife's actions. Everything that is going on is terrible. Now move on to the themes in the story. For our first theme, we have the importance of obedience to God. The first words of Paradise Lost state that the poem's main theme will be man's first disobedience. Milton narrates the story of Adam and Eve's disobedience, explains how and why it happens, and places the story within the larger context of Satan's rebellion and Jesus' resurrection. Raphael tells Adam about Satan's disobedience in an effort to give him a firm grasp of the threat that Satan and humankind's disobedience possess. In essence, Paradise Lost presents two moral paths that one can take after disobedience, the downward spiral of increasing sin and degradation represented by Satan, and the road to redemption represented by Adam and Eve. Our second theme, the hierarchical nature of the universe. Paradise Lost is about hierarchy as much as it is about obedience. The layout of the universe, with heaven above, hell below, and earth in the middle, presents the universe as a hierarchy based on the proximity to God and His grace. This spatial hierarchy leads to a social hierarchy of angels, humans, animals, and devils. The sun is closest to God with the archangels and cherubs behind him. Adam and Eve and the earth's animals comes next, with Satan and the other fallen angels following last. To obey God is to respect this hierarchy. And for our last theme, we have the fall as partly fortunate. In Book 12, Adam refers to his own sin as a phallic sculpa, or happy fall, implying that while the fall of humankind appears to be a catastrophe, it actually brings benefit. As a result of Adam and Eve's sin, God can exhibit pity and temperance in their penalties and eternal providence towards humanity. This gift of love and compassion from the Son to humanity is priceless. Humanity must now face pain and death, but they can also encounter kindness, salvation, and grace in ways they would not have otherwise. While humanity has fallen from grace, people can still save themselves by remaining faithful to God. Humanity's salvation through the Son's sacrifice and resurrection can begin to restore humanity's former status. In other words, sin and death will eventually bring good and recompense humanity. In this way, God's thinking and ultimate goal for humanity are justified. And now, let us move on to the symbolisms in the story. For our 
first symbolism, we have the scales in the sky. As Satan prepares to fight Gabriel, when he is discovered in paradise, God causes the image of a pair of golden scales to appear in the sky. On one side of the scales, he puts the consequences of Satan's running away. And on the other hand, he puts the consequences of Satan staying and fighting with Gabriel. The side that shows him staying and fighting flies up, signifying its lightness and worthlessness. These scales symbolize the fact that God and Satan are naturally on opposite sides of a struggle. God is all-powerful, and Satan and Gabriel both derive all their power from him. God scales for Satan to realize the futility of taking arms against one of God's angels again. For a second and last symbol, we have Adam's wreath. The wreath that Adam makes as he and Eve work separately in Book 9 is symbolic in several ways. First, it represents his love for her and his attraction to her. But, as he is about to give the wreath to her, he is shocked in noticing that she has eaten from the tree of knowledge makes him drop it to the ground. His dropping of the wreath symbolizes that his love and attraction to Eve is falling away. His image of her as a spiritual companion has been shattered completely. As he realizes her fallen state, the fallen wreath represents the loss of pure love. And to sum up our lesson today, the idea of the happy fall stands in contrast to the more common notion that Adam's action simply created sin and death and destroyed man's chance for blissful paradisical immortality. Both concepts of the fall existed in 17th century theology, and Milton chooses to accentuate the phallic culpa as part of his justification of God's ways to man, by emphasizing the good that will emerge from the fall of man, Milton makes the end of Paradise Lost, if not triumphant, at least optimistic. Adam and Eve are no longer the beautiful, but strangely aloof, innocence of books 1 through 8. At the end of the epic, as they leave Eden, Adam and Eve are truly human. Their innocence has been transformed by experience, and they now approach the world with a greater knowledge of what can happen and what consequences can follow evil actions. The pride they had in their inability to do evil has been replaced with the knowledge of what evil is and how easy it is to give in to both pride and evil. The lesson that God is always at work in the world, often through seemingly insignificant people and things, that the greatest heroes are those who suffer for truth, and that death leads to eternal life, are the images of hope and possibly triumph at the end of the poem. Adam and Eve go forth at the end with each other and with God. They know that through obedience, love, and reason, they can live good lives and overcome the evil that they have done. Their knowledge and their hope thus stand as Milton's justification for God's ways. And that's it for our lesson today. I hope that you'll learn something from me. Thank you for listening!